With me today are Hello and welcome to My Faculty Podcast at Walden University, created to provide further professional development and conversations relevant to faculty interests. This podcast is brought to you by the Office of Research and Doctoral Services. This is Lee Stoutlander. Today my guests are Sri Banerjee and Leilani Gelstad. Um, let's have both of you introduce yourselves. So Leilani? Hello, I am Leilani Gelstad, and I've been working closely with both faculty and student researchers for a little bit over 20, 25 years, and at Walden for about um, 19 years. So um, happy to share some perspectives from lots of different types of research <laughs> that we do at Walden. Great. And Sri? I am Dr. Sri Banerjee, um, core faculty for the College of Health Sciences and Public Policy. Um, I, I um, have myself in the field of medicine um, and then uh, transitioned over to public health. And currently, um, I teach um, uh, many um, types of research topics, including um, surveillance. Um, and um, I'm also a mentor um, uh, dissertation projects um, and serve as university research um, uh, every year as well um, for, for um, certain things. Great. So today's topic is using recruitment sites to get participants. So Leilani, could you start us off with just kind of a definition of what we're talking about when we mention recruitment sites? Sure. Yes, there are quite a few out there and it's an ever-changing landscape. We have talked to you know faculty and student researchers probably once a month I learn about one new service or site that can assist researchers in getting in touch with participants who meet certain inclusion criteria and it usually consists of this a company and you know I'm not going to promote any one company in particular. I honestly I don't perceive that one stands above the others in terms of the quality. And I'll, I'll give a range here in just a moment of some of the different um, prices that you could expect at, at this time. And like I said, it's ever changing. Um, so there's quite a few companies out there and they tap into um, what we might think of as markets or, or uh, audiences of um, thousands of people who are willing to take um, surveys and some are also willing to be interviewed, but most of them focus on finding survey respondents for various kinds of researchers. And they don't just exist for academic researchers. They um, probably do a good chunk of their business with marketing researchers. So people who are looking to test products in their target market. And so we as academic researchers often um, you know, kind of wade over into their area and, and use their services. For example, if a researcher is, um, you know, studying parents of children with autism, you know, I'm not sure anyone would consider that a market it for marketing purposes. Maybe it is, I don't know. But for research purposes, that certainly is a very specialized group. And, you know, there may be certain of these companies that have um, data on the demographics and the family makeup of um, the people who have signed up um, as being willing to take surveys. And so something as specialized though is knowing whether or not they have children, first of all. I think most panels, you know, they can filter out parents and non-parents, but something as specialized as knowing if their child has a certain dis disability, that may or may not um, be something that the company can and screen for you. So um, there's quite a range out there. And um, I think I'll just mention a few of the more popular ones by name. Survey Monkey Audience has been around for a while. And I think everyone is already, not everyone, but many of us are familiar already with Survey Monkey as simply as a survey platform. So you can do anything from a, a very simple free account to a fancy all bells and whistles type of account that has a lot of different features just to host your survey. So in other words, just to put your survey into a format where people who receive your link can click on answers um, or even type in answers if that's what um, 
you need. And SurveyMonkey exists as a survey platform, but then they have this additional survey, I'm sorry, additional service that's called SurveyMonkey Audience, and that will um, connect you to people who meet your inclusion criteria. This works for some researchers, and this doesn't work for other researchers, because like I said, some social science researchers, for example, might have such very specialized criteria. I think I looked at a study a few weeks ago that specifically wanted to talk um, or to survey people who had worked in social services with veterans. And that's so very specific. I don't think SurveyMonkey audience could help you find those people. You'd have much better luck um, finding partner organizations that actually serve veterans and, and going about your participant recruitment that way. But if your um, inclusion criteria were something, maybe it was just, um, let's say your inclusion criteria were just that you want to survey veterans. I have a feeling that SurveyMonkey audience could help with that. And so you just have to make an inquiry. It's kind of a, from what I can tell on these different um, companies, and, and there are at least two dozen. So, um, and they range in their pricing for from the least that I've seen um, that they charged a researcher was about $3 per participant that they found. So that means if you need 100 participants, and if you're able to qualify, if your inclusion criteria um, are simple enough, and you only need um, if 100, and it's $3 a person, obviously that's $300. But I've also talked to researchers who had very specific and challenging uh, inclusion criteria. For example, I, we worked with a student researcher who needed people who lived in one particular country but were expats of another particular country and worked in a certain field. Like that is so narrow. Those people are out there, but from Survey Monkey audience's perspective, you know, there are going to be a lot fewer of those people. And if you needed 50, the price would probably be more like um, 17, 20, or even the highest I've seen is $35 per participant. Wow. And in, in the end, yeah, the, in the end, that researcher decided, no, I'm just going to use a different approach because I can't remember how many re, uh, participants that person needed, but that adds up really quickly if it's $35 per participant. And, and that's not even... Um, let me think. That does include what they pay the participant for their time, which is not much. It, it, it usually, and again, every company does it differently. Some companies pay their survey takers in the form of making donations to charities of their choice. And that's, so for some people, that's what motivates them to take surveys is they get to have donations made um, to the charities of their choice. Other companies literally pay kind of a wage, if you want to call it that, um, like $10 an hour or something to people who take surveys. And um, you're also going to, in addition to making sure that person gets paid, you're paying the company kind of a finder's fee. So when I, even when I say it's um, three to $35 per participant, usually that doesn't include the 10 to 20% overall fee that the company charges. So it, it is a very expensive um, service, to be very honest. Um, and I know that for a lot of our doctoral student research, many of them are self-funded. And so they're looking usually for something that's a little bit more um, affordable. So I, I think it comes up most often as a I don't want to call it a last resort, but it's usually not people's first choice. I think um, the people who tend to go right to SurveyMonkey audience or some similar service, um, actually, let me just say a couple of the other services just so I'm not, I'm really not pushing SurveyMonkey or any other particular one, but sentiment, sentiment with a C. Um, so it's C-E-N-T-I-M-E-N-T. -E -E That's one of the ones that I know only recently charged one of our students $3 per participant. So that's why that one's at the top of my brain. And she was able to get all of her participants, I think in just a few days, was very happy um, with the, um, you know, the pricing and the service. And I also, uh, I remember she shared with me that they screened out respondents who did not complete the survey and or who, uh, and so she didn't have to pay for people who started it but didn't finish it, which is great. And then they also screened out 
um, people, they, they, I guess they throw in a comprehension check question just to make sure the person taking the survey is really paying attention and really, and I'm not familiar exactly with what types of comprehension checks um, they use, but like I said, it varies across companies. But then if the person, uh, if it, if it, seems that based on the comprehension check question that they either were just randomly clicking or that they weren't, you know, actually comprehending the question, those get tossed out and you don't pay for those. So, and that's always a risk, frankly, with any type of survey, even if you're collecting data in, in um, face to face, I used to collect data in uh, middle school classrooms. And I have to say <laughs> quite a few of those had to be thrown out because the person completing the questionnaire wasn't taking it seriously. So um, it, it's, it's, pretty nice actually that the the service builds that in but the um the range of uh, if if a researcher were to type in um recruiting survey participants or finding research participants you will find a bunch of things that will pop up and i recently learned that there is a reddit site where um it it, it I believe it's reserved for psychology and I don't know the tag off the top of my head, but that's again, something you could Google or look up is there's a Reddit site for psychology surveys um, that uh, I think has, it gets, because with Reddit, you can see how many people have read um, the post and certainly if they interact with the engage with the post. And I think somebody said it, it gets seen by 500,000 plus people. So <laughs> that could be a, an effective way with no charge you know you just have to join reddit and be you know set up an account um but yeah so there, there's quite a range out there and i would really encourage researchers you know don't just go with the first one you learn about or you know maybe hear about a person talking about one and just you, you i would recommend that you at least scope out at least three or four and make a well-informed decision so that you kind of understand well is what's what's a fair price Pricing, because um, they know, they, they try to, the pricing tends to change and fluctuate because they are trying to stay, stay competitive with one another. And um, it's a quite a full market right now that they're competing for <laughs> business. But um, like I said, the more um, rare your participants are, um, based on the inclusion criteria, the more you're, you'd expect to pay. Let's jump over to Sri. What's your experience with using these kind of sites? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll give you uh, my, my perspective. Um, and I, I, I'll start off, you know, by saying um, at, at, that, that I, I'm in agreement um, with, you know, uh, what Dr. Guest said has, uh, you know, um, described um, in, in, in a lot of these observations. Um, uh, as I, I have a slightly, uh, you know, different take on, on some of the things, um, you know, and I, I want to start off by saying, um, there's a difference between, you know, survey instrumentation um, and, and actually survey platforms, you know. Um, and I'm talking about survey platforms, um, of course, you know, you have SurveyMonkey um, and um, even Google Forms. Um, surprisingly, um, Google Forms, and uh, this is uh, one of the platforms um, that I used in a collaborative um, research project with COVID um, and um, really had um, good scope, um, a broad scope. I recently ran a um, geospatial analysis um, on this and, and found that um, the, uh, the types of respondents and the number of respondents that came from um, geospatial locations um, were very, uh, were varied. Um, so if you, but, but what I think um, the bottom line is if we use technology effectively, you know, um, if, if we use um, uh, different types of technology, um, then we can yield um, some really interesting results. Um, but uh, yes, definitely, um, you know, do a well research. Um, so um, I think um, that, that that's kind of, uh, you know, my message and my perspective. Okay. Um anyone who wants to answer this. Um, so what are the positives to using this type of mechanism to recruit? I can share a couple um, and then let Dr. Banerjee add to that um, if he likes. The, um, 
sort of red carpet customer, I would say, of who really loves these services are people for whom just time is everything and they don't um, want to spend several weeks or months collecting data because the scope of the um, the audience that some of these services can provide a researcher with are, are vast. It is vast. Um, so I I'd be interested in hearing Dr. Banerjee a little more about your geospatial ana analysis. To um, I think as as especially in social sciences, we've been aware for a long time that you know bias in selecting our participants impacts our research in a negative way. And for example, I'm aware that with our Walden doctoral student researchers, many of them do some sort of convenience sampling through organizations in their communities or even in their online communities. So maybe it's national, but it's there's a little mm -hmm. bit of bias because they tend to go with what they know. So, you know, if mm -hmm. I'm trying to um, you know, back to my example I was using earlier, if I'm trying to survey parents of children with autism, if I truly wanted as representative a population as possible, then it would be a mistake to only recruit through the Facebook groups that I know about, or, you know, recruit locally in my city where I live, right? If you really want a representative sample, you're going to do everything you can to try to um, tap into uh, a much broader population. And, and then, of course, even something we have to bear in mind, because all of the services that I can think of, or at least that I've encountered through our, our, our Walden researchers, they're all online based. I'm sure there are some that will do old school, either door to door or telephone calling. They they are out there. They're also very costly because it you know requires not just you're not just paying the respondents, but you're paying the workers. So um, I'm sure they exist, and those might help break that um, technology or you know internet access barrier that still exists in some parts of the U.S. and certainly in some parts of the world where you're going to very much bias your sample if you only um, yeah, but, sorry. recruit through the internet. I mean, even if you get door to door or phone, you're still only picking up people that actually answer the door. Exactly. Good point. Yep. Yeah. Or, yeah. So there are all these sources of bias, but but the, so that would be one of the downsides. Um, or I, I, it could be, I guess, you know, if you were discussing it in your um, <laughs> results uh, or or you know um, interpretation of your results, you would you would talk about how possibly using these services can help you go beyond some of your biases. Um, but then there are still, like I said, just the um, technological limitations and breach limitations. Yeah, uh, yeah, definitely, definitely. And and those are all good points. Um, I, and I, I think one of the advantages of technology and something that, you know, pe um, people, I guess um, it's a common myth um, is that, you know, technology is just, um, recording data. That's it. You know, it's just numbers. But the reality is that behind those numbers, like, um, for instance, I was just looking at a project today um, with uh, the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey, and, you know, a, a process um, behind um, getting some of the lab results was a, a huge gas chromatography, you know, um, which exists within a lab. So that had to take place um, before, uh, you know, a, a nationally representative um, uh, data w was actually available for everyone, everybody to use. So there's actually a lot of primary data collection um, that's uh, taking place behind the scenes. Um, and, and a lot of funds, a lot of our taxpayer funds are, are going to, you know, uh, to, 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 to funding um, those things. So, you know, I, I'm, I'm urging researchers I'm urging my colleagues um, and students to, you know, let's take advantage of them. You know, let, let's 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 take advantage of that um, of all of the uh, collected data that exists um, on a national level, um, and and use technology to do so. So, what are the disadvantages of using it? 
<clears throat> well, one of the things that you can um, run into is if there are people taking surveys as a job, uh, we haven't talked about the Mechanical Turk yet, uh, the Amazon, and I believe Dr. Banerjee has more experience with that directly than I do. But, you know, you literally, literally are paying people for their time in doing tasks. And by, you know, presenting a survey, there, there's a chance people who want to make the money will, you know, create fake data. And um, yeah. I think from what I've seen, each of the various platforms has a few checks in place to um, try to prevent this, but um, you, you could run into that any place, but um, many would argue that, well, if you're not paying people, then you're kind of redu much reducing the likelihood of people faking data just because they want to be in your study. And so um, I suppose the researcher could just try to <laughs> Be as clear as possible about the purpose of the study, and um, and and to make sure that the inclusion criteria are really clear, and you know build in some of those comprehension chat questions, even if the platform doesn't do that for you in such a way that they're going to ensure that you don't have to pay for those. I believe there are some other platforms where you still have to pay if people completed it, and even if they fail your comprehension check. So that again, that's just something to look into as you're um, looking at the different services out there. The, the, Dr. Gelsad, I, I, I think I think you bring up a really good point there. And um, I think um, one way, one practical way that I think researchers, um, you know, our, our researchers can try to uh, prevent that um, is to provide maybe, you know, one question um, that somehow shows how many seconds did the person take to um, complete the survey, you know? Um, if it took two seconds to go through 20 questions, then, you know, that may not be uh, something that was honestly answered, you know? Um, so so if, if we can try to, you know, come up with creative solutions to make technology even better than what it is, you know? Um, you, you use this to, to uh, create um, uh, samples, create um, respondents, which really answers those tough questions, really gets to those rare diseases once we don't have solutions about, you know, um, or, or, or um, you know, even business solutions um, where we can collaborate and, 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 and come together and, 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 and find, find common ground, find common solutions, then, then that would be great. You know, uh, 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 convert the disadvantages of, of technology to, 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 to uh, improve research quality. So. I have found that, like my experience, it was with Survey Monkey, but that they require a specific mm -hmm. format. So the mm -hmm. consent form tends to be much shorter than what Walden's is, and they only allow so many questions and that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, and 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 so you have to pay. There, there's different levels of payment. So if you pay us, and and of course. You know, as a student, um, you're on a budget, so you know that that's a smaller tier. And then for for a large for for you know, if you want more questions, then you pay a little bit more uh, to be able to do so. Um, now, you know, Google Forms um, has a different system, and there's some others that you know you may want to look into. Um, but of course, you know, you want to also also evaluate the um, advantages and disadvantages of you know as some of these things. Leilani, does the IRB have allowances if the form, if the site that they student wants to use doesn't allow a longer consent form? Can students get away with a shorter one? Yes, um, I'm. We actually this is pretty new, um, but we do have a special consent form for anonymous surveys, and it just happens to be very brief. It's about half of the length. Um, because if, if a survey is anonymous, then a lot of the typical things you talk about in a consent form are moot points. They're just not relevant. And the privacy section is much briefer because all, all you really have to say about privacy is that, well, I, I'm not gonna ask for your name at any time. That's the end of it. Um, so you don't have to talk about you know the confidentiality and 
obligations to report and things like that. And so that's pretty new um, We uh, that we have it walled in soon. Um, it was just as of last week, actually. <laughs> so it's a really timely question. And in the past, when it has come up, yes, we just work with those researchers and it has been fine every time for them to um, use a more typical um, template that is used at the site because the premise is with, and I'm trying to remember, yeah, with SurveyMonkey, everybody who sees your invitation has already consented to doing surveys for research purposes. So they're pre-consented if you want to look at it that way. So that's how we've been addressing that issue with our, re our researchers. And in a few other of the, pl of the platforms or the, um, these environments, sometimes you're right, sometimes it's more of a, a limitation on number of characters. And so we'll just work with the researcher to keep it very brief and to use a formatting that's more like bullets rather than these you know, sentences. And you know, come to find out that's the direction that our regular consent form is is starting to take um, is to use bullets and um, you know just like researcher title colon title instead of the name of the study you know in in prose <laughs> because one thing we do know about human nature is that when you've got long paragraphs people just tend to not read them at all but if you at least have bullets people tend to skim them and absorb a little bit more and, uh, and comprehend a little bit more of the information. So, yep, we're happy to work with researchers on that. Very good. So, we're almost out of time. Does anybody have any last comments they'd like to make about this topic? I guess I'd like to add um, the Walden participant pool is something that we have had for a long time, and we would love for it to be even more um, engaged. Uh, it, for lack of a better word. Um, we would love, and let me explain what it is. Um, it's essentially a virtual bulletin board for Walden students and faculty researchers and staff researchers as well. And- So I can attest to it, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep, yep, you just, uh, you complete a very brief form for the participant pool managers, and then they will post your study um, and the inclusion criteria and a really, really short blurb, and then some sort of link for the researcher to either click on the survey or contact the researcher for an interview. And I think we, we did have a surge in activity around the pandemic that um, a lot of people were just really concerned about researchers not being able to get the research done. And so there was this surge of people how, you know, say, how can I help? And it was lovely because people would go to the participant pool site and volunteer for studies. And, you know, it just, it takes a little bit of effort and not that many of those people agreed to let us keep contacting them as new uh, surveys and interviews came out. So I would put out, I'd like to put it out there, an invitation for anyone who's listening. If you can find it in your heart to consider taking part in some Walden surveys. If you, if you feel like that would be a good use of your time um, and a contribution to the Walden community, it, it is um, tremendous, especially if a researcher is looking for, you know, eight to 12 interviewees and you can be one of their interviewees. Um, <laughs> that's, that's a tremendous gift of your time. And so you can do that by going to the Walden participant pool website. And then I think it's at the bottom, you just click, um, you know, join the pool. And that just means you'll get an email once a month at the beginning of the month telling you what the newest studies that were just added for the month. It's typically about uh, 10 yeah. to 20 studies per month. Mm -hmm. it, it, that can vary, it can fluctuate. And um, like if I look at it any given time, I probably qualify for maybe three studies. And if I can you know, do it uh, quickly, and it, because a lot of them are just looking for human beings. Some of them aren't as specific as, you know, um, people who work in a specific profession or we, we do organize the participant pool. Um, there's, we have a section that's studies seeking educators, studies seeking veterans, studies that are seeking healthcare providers. And I think we have a category, yeah, just for the general population. And so um, I'm gonna be working with some of our other partners at Walden to try to encourage more of our masters and undergraduate students to be engaged with the participant pool. I think we've all been hesitant over the years to make it a requirement. Um, 
I personally don't have a problem with that as the person who does the ethics reviews for these studies. I think that as long as you give students an alternate option for an assignment, it's great to encourage them to go be in a study and then write a little short paper about what that was like for you. Um, and frankly, that, yeah, that's how universities have been doing a great deal of their research for many decades. And, and it has its flaws and you have to acknowledge and discuss those, um, you know, the, the bit of, uh, the bias of, of them being in your in your community. But it, given that Walden is such a diverse community in terms of age and mm -hmm. geographical areas, ethnicity and um, our our um, our work, our professions, it, it's honestly in Walden's more diverse than the average college campus, at least the campuses that I went to. And so I really would love to for us to keep growing that and to um, Get some more traffic there, literally, because I think there's this. Our student population has potentially a lot to gain by seeing what research looks like and taking part in it in some way, um, either as a survey respondent or an interviewee. And then, um, obviously, it helps our researchers <laughs> get in touch with people who can uh, help them complete their studies. I, 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 I just wanted to end, end with um, one last tidbit and, um, you know, um, yeah, yeah, yeah um, uh, and, and Le Leilani's, uh, you know, comment on, on, on the pool, the study participant pool, um, you know, I can attest to that. It's, it's uh, very useful. Um, uh, Le and so, so, you know, um, uh, Leilani and I, you know, have been talking about, you know, um, the use of technology um, and study recruitment. And, and look, you know, whoever's listening to this, um, it can be intimidating, you know, um, using technology. I mean, um, uh, 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 you know, uh, creating a kind of uh, a, a survey and and just kind of um, use it in a in a in, in a way that you know traditionally that that's something that seems more natural, you know, but uh, technology has come a long way. Um, these companies that we have talked to you about and and told you about. These things, these are advancing, and and there's more ways that that we can um, harness technology um, to be able to um, not only um, do more study recruitment, um, but also find um, creative ways to kind of um, synergize um, efforts between disciplines um, and study participation and study recruitment, so that we can um, shorten dissertation um, time. And and you know um, wh whether it is retention um, in education or uh, wh whichever discipline, um, I think I think this there is a way forward. Um, and you know I, I talk about of course my, my you know expertise is in uh, mapping and tools, but there are so many like interactive dashboards. Um, I create dashboards um, uh, pretty much almost every other day um, uh, um, around geospatial issues, um, social issues, um, social determinants of health. And and these all of these things, you know, are are, are connected. You know, um, they're all connected. Um, when you're talking about um, study recruitment, um, proper study recruitment. You know, how how, how do you determine um, that you're having a good representation in in and and how it, that's another topic. So so th there's so many things, and I I, I think um, in in some ways, um, technology can be um, that panacea. Um, that that resolve those things with um, study recruitment. So so I wanted to end and end with that message. Um, Great. Well, thank you, Leilani. Thank you, Sri, so much for sharing your expertise on this. Thank you for joining us today for Research Talk. Our music is by Audionautics.com, and I'm Dr. Lee Statlander. Today's podcast was sponsored by Walden University's Office of Research and Doctoral Services.